Turn to Matthew in your Bibles, chapter 13. We're going to look at the last three um, parables in this chapter. And if you'd follow along, if you'd read uh, starting in verse 44 through 50, uh, we're going to look at these parables today. Again, Matthew chapter 13, verse, starting in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it to shore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but they threw away the bad. So will it be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Father, we ask today that as we have come to your word and we worship not only in what we give, what we, he what we sing, but what we hear. And Father, may, may we think your thoughts after you. For you are the great king and glorious father. You're the one that created us from the dust of the ground. You're the one that in light of our sins sent your son Jesus Christ to die in our place. And so, Father, today we want to know you better and more. We want to keep us from temptation and sin in our lives. Help us to be more vigilant. And, Father, I pray that you would give us ability to understand your word this morning by your Holy Spirit. We confess our sin. We confess it before you, saying, Lord, forgive us. And, Father, we claim your promise that you have forgiven us and cleansed us of all unrighteousness. I ask you to fill all of us, especially me, with your Holy Spirit. By faith, I do believe that you have granted that. In Jesus' name, amen. So there are three more parables here. And they all start out by the kingdom of heaven is like. And then they give an example of what the kingdom of heaven is actually like. First he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. Then he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for pearls. And then he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that catches all kinds of fish. But what is he telling us about the kingdom of heaven in these parables? What is he really trying to tell us something that we would be able to do or to think or to observe in our own lives. Now, the kingdom of heaven is different than the kingdom of earth. The kingdom of earth, men do things the way they want to. But in the kingdom of heaven, what we do is we submit to the authority of the king, don't we? In a kingdom, there's always a king. In the kingdom of heaven, there is only one king, and that is King Jesus. In the kingdom of earth, the kingdom is ourselves. We obey ourselves, we do the things the way we want to, and we ourselves are the ones that uh, we have loyalty to. So there's really two choices we have today. There are self or Christ, ourself or God. And so what is the kingdom of heaven like? What does he want us to know about this kingdom that has Jesus as the king? Let's look at them, the first two again briefly and then the third. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The next parable says the same idea. He says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls 
who on finding one of the pearl, one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had to buy it. And so from these verses, I think there are three lessons that we can learn about life in the kingdom of God. There are three lessons that we can do and learn about how do we live in the kingdom of God. And the first one is this. When you treasure God, you will seek him with all intensity. See, one of the things this passage talks about us is that God has to be the treasure of our life. See, we treasure all sorts of things in our life. You see, a lot of people want to do this with religion. They want to try God out. But we don't try God out. We, we simply just submit to him. We surrender to him. You don't try a king out. Just like you don't try, a president doesn't get a trial run for a month and the, let the people see how he does, right? He's elected and then we submit and then four years later another one's elected and another one's elected. But in a kingdom, there's no elections. In the kingdom of heaven, there's never been an election, has there? There has always been one king. And that king is the benevolent, sovereign, good, majestic, holy Jesus Christ. He is the good one, and he is the king, and he is not up for election. In other words, his term has no limit. So this is obvious that we don't just try on Jesus for size. We don't try on Christianity for size. We either are living for the king, or we're not living for the king. You see, this is obvious in the pearl merchant. In order to recognize a pearl of great value, he had to know a lot about pearls. He had to study pearls. He had to understand the value of a pearl. And he had to be able to search for a pearl or pearls with some sort of intelligence. In the days, you see, this is also applies to the man who found a treasure in the field. It may sound to us like this man just happened to stumble across a treasure by accident. But that probably was not the case. You see, in the days of Jesus, hiding your valuables, hiding your, your stuff was commonplace. There were no banks back then. Do you realize that? There was, no, there was no place that you would put your valuables. There was no safety deposit boxes. There was nothing. And so what people did normally was bury their treasure, bury their money. So also, we know from the historian Josephus that it tells us that Palestine was a battleground area for centuries. Families would often bury their clothing and jewelry and money and the valuable items that they have to protect them from plundering soldiers. Because there was, again, there was no banks. There was no police force that would protect them in their house. And so when the soldiers would come in, they would take and plunder everything, which we see not only in Exodus and all sorts of things in the Old Testament, but throughout the Bible. And so people would bury their stuff. Over the years, the ground of Palestine became a treasure house. When an owner was buried his treasure and then died or say he was driven from his land, that treasure many times was lost or unfounded. Um, it was just sitting there. Uh, you, you all remember, uh, uh, what was it called, the Beverly Hillbillies? And, and uh, Beverly Hillbillies, he, uh, I guess Jed Clampett was was sitting around one day with his gun, decided to shoot something, and up comes a bubbling pool, right? Oil, that is. Texas gold, Texas tea. And, and uh, he moves to Beverly Hills where the, the story and the, the whole scene of that show uh, is the contrast of someone who is a very simple-minded person and engaged with, all of a sudden has a lot of money uh, that he always had because he had owned the property but he never knew it. He had a treasure under his feet. You see, more than likely, that's what the man of this story did. He, he, while Jed may have accidentally happened to him, he probably searched out the property. 
See, what happened was a lot of times when people would buy a property, they didn't know they had a treasure trove underneath their property until one day they were digging up or they were cultivating the ground and they found a treasure. Or there were sometimes were professional treasure hunters and they would go onto a property and they would find a treasure and in this case, he would find a treasure so valuable so great and the property was for sale he would go and sell what he had all of it and buy that property the point is I'm making is that the person doing this didn't just stumble across the treasure by accident he found it because he was looking for it you know a lot of times what you look for is what you find if you don't look for it you don't see it if you don't look for the for God's grace every day in your life you know what you probably will not see it if you don't look for uh, the activity of God in your life or in other people's life, you probably won't see it because the world has so many problems, whether it is wars, whether it is economic crises, whether it is failed, you know, people go through all sorts of things every single week. And if you don't look for the hand of God, if you don't look for the activity of God, if you don't look to praise God, you probably will never ever praise Him because you'll just see what, what's, what everybody else sees. you got to look for it. In the same way the pearl merchant, he didn't just stumble across a pearl of great value. He found it by looking for it. And he knew enough about pearls to recognize a good one when he saw it. In the same way, finding God comes as a result of looking for him. Intentionally, find, intentionally finding him. Having an intensity of life that I'm going to find God or bust. You know those, those things, I'm going west or bust. Or I'm going for the gold or bust. I'm doing everything I can to find God. And you don't do it by accident. You do it because you have decided to set your heart and your life towards that pursuit. Now, the question I have and I want to ask you. Does all this mean because the treasure was in the ground buried, does God hide himself from us or does he make himself difficult to find? In other words, does God play a game of hide and seek? Well, you should be up here. That was my answer. No, he doesn't. In fact, the Bible tells us that God is evident to every person in this world in Romans 1. We have a knowledge of God. Every person in this world has a knowledge of God. But the problem isn't that God is hiding himself. The problem is the sinfulness bent of our heart. The failure of our heart. You see, the, the failures in our life comes because of sin. Sin has invaded my life and your life and we battle it every single week, even as Christians. You see, we, we deal with sin in our life. Every thought, every word, every deed of our lives have to, be, have to be recognized before God. So, he doesn't hide, neither but though he's not always visible. You see, we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14, which is an important verse here. It says the natural man or the natural person does not accept what? The things of the Spirit of God. For they are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. See there are two people. There is a natural man and a spiritual man. There are only two kinds of people in the world. A natural man, while he knows that there is a God, while he has given enough, people said, well, I don't know if there's a God or not, are, are, actually, are actually calling God a liar because he says he has given you plenty of information today that there is a God and that he's it. The problem is that natural man can't understand the things of the Spirit of God because his heart doesn't want to, doesn't want to look for him, doesn't want to seek him. You know why? It's because this. I'm going to tell you why. How's that? Okay? The reason why is because we want to be the king instead of Jesus. We want to be in the, in the throne room instead of Christ. 
And so when we think about the world with us being in the center of it, of course it makes no sense about the things of God. You see, the Bible says in Psalm 14, 2 and 3, it says this, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there is anyone who understands or seeks after God. They have all turned, he says, aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none that is good, not even one. You see, the problem is not with God. God's not playing a game of hide and seek. The problem is, is that our hearts are bent so that we don't look for him. We don't seek him. It is very clear in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 12. He says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Now that is an indictment of humankind, isn't it? That is an indictment of how we, should, how we should see ourselves, but how we really are. You see, the people of this world, when they reject Christianity, or they say that Christianity is just a crutch, it's not really real, have really never have put in their heart a desire to seek Him. Or a desire to, to seek it. Because what they're doing is seeking some, either another God. Or placing themselves in the throne room which should be God's and God's alone. See we have to understand that by nature we're sinners. Adam's disobedience. Because of Adam's disobedience we were found guilty before God. Adam sinned, we sinned. And secondly, the Bible says that grace always comes before action. Grace before action. In, indicative before imperative. And so we look at this passage in John 6, I'm going to John 6, It says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. In other words, God has to do the drawing, not we ourselves. But because no one naturally seeks God... God seeks us. Isn't that great? God is seeking you today. God is, God is calling you to come to Him. He's calling you to, to repent of your sins, whether they be many or few. I would purpose that the search, our search, is very much related to the fact that God is seeking you and me. He's seeking people. He is offering people of the world a chance to be reconciled with Him. The Bible says in Luke chapter 19 verse 10 that the Son of Man came to do what? To seek and to save that which was that which was well, that's better. Could have been better, but that's better. He came and seek that which was lost. So sorely before his death he said you didn't choose me but I chose you that you should go and bear fruit and it should abide. So what he's saying is that our best efforts, our best efforts fall short of the righteousness and the standard that is required by God even to have a relationship with him or to be in heaven with him for all eternity. So that's, that's the first thing. We have to seek God in, in, intently and impassionately and um, with, 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 um, with intensity. But we also have to realize that we're at fault for not doing that. But secondly, the Bible says in Jeremiah, you will seek me and find me if you search, if you seek me with all your, what? Heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. So the, God's not hiding himself going, oh, they might find me. He's not doing that. He's saying if you seek me, and you're seeking me because you've experienced God's grace. You start to seek me. He wants you to seek out a relationship with him. He wants you to look for him. When we seek him, we are guaranteed, guess what? In this passage, we're guaranteed we'll find him. If you really want a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can't wait around and say, well, if, if God shows me this or if God proves this to me. No, no. You have to seek him. You have to say to yourself, you know, God, I want to know. 
I want to know, I, 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 you know, some people would say, I believe, help my unbelief. But this requires three things on our part. You've got to desire to seek God. And God has to give you the grace to desire Him. But when you desire Him, you don't just say, oh, okay, it's over. It'd be, it'd be like telling your wife or, or someone you love, or your children, saying, you know what? Uh, I, I don't really, I, I'm not going to spend any more time with you. I don't care about you. Uh, but I still have a relationship with you. God doesn't want to be worked that way. See, he has to say, you, we have to have a desire on our part. We have to have a determination, is secondly. He requires determination, like a pearl merchant that traveled the world looking for a valuable pearl. We must be willing to put forth the effort it means to have a relationship with God there. Discernment, just like the pearl merchant, had to be able to judge between a good pearl and a bad pearl. There's a story that I read this week about a man who went to a junkyard or a junk store near his office. This man, he stopped in and he bought an old wooden chair for about $10. He took it to the office and showed it to one of his employees who had a lot of experience dealing with antiques. She asked him if there were any other chairs at this junk store. He said, oh, there are a few more, but I think I got the best. Well, she later came and went to the store and came back with her own chair. And she asked, she asked this man, didn't you see this Seashaw, Seashaw Walker chair? He said, I, you mean the one with the aluminum back? Yeah, I saw it, but I didn't buy it because the one I got was $10 and the one you got was $15. She laughed and said, <laughs> well, it's worth a lot more than $15. And she went to the internet and she brought up an antique website and she showed him that the chair she bought for $15 was actually worth $1,200. See, some people see just a chair. A chair is a chair. And they don't know any difference between one chair and another chair. But this guy's employee was able to recognize the difference. And he, she, would, she was able to make a great deal because of it. In the first parable that we looked at, the man's friend just uh, thought as he was buying the field, they didn't see the value of the field. They didn't see the value of the pearl. There are some people who look at your life and they don't recognize the treasure of Christianity. They don't recognize the treasure it is to know God. They may, they may be your friends, your family, people you work with. They don't understand why you would give up your Sundays many times to, to worship God, to, to, to be with God's people because they, it doesn't make sense to them. They're natural people. They're not seeking after God. They might wonder why you give money. Why do you give money to the cause that you go to? Why, why do you do that? It seems like it's, it's immaterial. Uh, and they may wonder, why do you stri strive to live a certain morality? Why not just let be, let go and live and let live? To them, it's just a religion. To them, it's just a field. To them, it's just a chair. But when you find God, you have found a treasure. So when you seek God, seek Him with intensity. But when you treasure God, also, number two, you need to seek Him before everything else. You see, you may seek Him, but you got to do this first. You got to seek Him before everything else. The reactions of a man who found the, tra the treasure in the field and the pearl merchant are identical. They each sold every single thing that they had in order to buy what they recognized as most valuable. The spiritual parallel is obvious. A relationship with Jesus Christ is the most valuable possession you have. A relationship with God is valuable. It's, it, it's better than Disney World. It's better than a, a, a shopping spree. It's better than winning the lottery for a million dollars. It's better. For people who know God are rich. Not in the way the world is rich, but in the way that we should be rich. There's an old gospel song that says this. 
I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have him than riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-scarred hands than to be a king in a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world can afford today. When can you consider all that we can hope to accomplish in our life, all that we can hope to accumulate on our own, it does not add up to the riches that God offers in knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. You see, the person who gives up relatively little to gain a lot is a wise person. It's been said that God offers the chance or God offers to us to trade what we cannot keep to gain what we cannot lose. See, God wants you to recognize that a relationship with him is worth more than anything. That you own anything you could ever aspire to. You may have dreams for yourself, but his dreams, his desires, his will is greater and greater than anything you could have because it is life abundant. Life abundant. And so God is the treasure should be sought before anything else. It should be sought with intensity and treasuring God finally. Treasuring God. When you treasure God, you will seek him. And I put it this way, with an alien righteousness. You seek God, when you seek God, you seek him with what? Intent, with intensity. When you seek God, you seek him before anything else. And when you seek God, you need to seek him with alien righteousness. Now, I'm not talking about Star Wars or Star Trek or something like that. When I say alien righteousness, I mean something that is outside of ourselves. Something that makes you right with God, not based upon your works. Look what it says in, in verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 47 through 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace that the place where we'll be, where in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So according to Jesus in that passage, in that verse, there are two categories of people. Everybody on the planet falls and you either are a good fish or a bad fish. And it, it doesn't mean how you smell. It just means that you're either a good fish or a bad fish. You're either wicked or righteous. And see, most of us don't think we're wicked. Do we? Most of us have a very good image of ourselves. Most of us really, really think we're okay compared to at least somebody else in the world. But that's not what God wants us to understand. God isn't, isn't concerning your deeds. He's concerning also the state of your soul. If he were referring to your deeds, then the separation of the wicked and the righteous would be very easy. Every fish, if he, if he were just considering our deeds, every single fish would be tossed into the furnace. Do you understand that? Every single fish, if it wasn't for Jesus... Because if he's just considering the deeds we do in this body, our deeds have already condemned us, haven't they? Every, everything that we amount to, everything we have strived for, every work that we have done has been tainted with a rebellion heart of sin. And we cannot offer to God things we think are good when they have been tainted with just a little bit of, little bit of sin because God is holy and will not accept sin. You see, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And in this little parable, the, the, the simile or the metaphor is that the angels will come 
and they will separate the good and the bad fish, the good and the bad, or the, the righteous and the unrighteous. And the unrighteous will be put in a fiery furnace. In other words, they will be burned for all eternity. There will be pain and gnashing and suffering and, and agony. Agony that you have not ever known for eternity. The rest of the existence forever and ever and ever. And I don't, I don't know about you, but if that is not a motivation to share the good news of Christ, to get people to seek God rather than to seek their own kingdom and their own righteousness, I don't know what is. Because if we love this world, if we really love this world, and we really treasure the kingdom of heaven, and that is the, the glories of God and the, and the relationship we have with him, and realize that when Jesus died for us, our sin was cast upon him and the wrath and the fiery furnace was cast upon Jesus so that we could take on and give credit to us our righteous, his righteousness to us. So when God looks upon you as a Christian, he sees perfection. He sees the righteous deeds of Christ. He sees perfect, he, he doesn't see your sin. He sees someone else's deeds. Not yours. He sees Christ's deeds. And so, if we are going to treasure God, if we are truly going to treasure God, we need to seek Him with an alien right. We need to be confident that when we come to God, it is not based upon our efforts, our meritorious works, anything within us that we deserve something more than other people because we are just like everybody else, aren't we? We are just as much as need of the grace and mercy of God every single moment of our lives. But I'm going to tell you, if you have no desire to seek Him, you will be one of those who is cast into the fire. If you have no desire to seek Him, you won't seek Him. And so... We fall into those two categories. We either good or bad fish. Without him, it's no contest. We all belong to the furnace. With him, however, we can learn to become righteous. We can learn to walk with him. Now we don't become righteous. We are righteous. And then our righteousness in practice becomes like we are in person or in state. You see, what Jesus is saying, these final three parables of the kingdom, he's saying... I am offering you something more valuable, more valuable than anything else you could ever be offered in the world. It's an offer to everyone here. It's an offer to everyone in the sound of my voice. It doesn't matter where you are, rich, poor, old, male, female, regardless of geography, regardless of where you come from, it is offered to you and there's only one way to find it. You have to look. You have to look for it. Because if you don't look for it, guess what? You're not going to find it. You see, he won't drag you there. He will draw you there. I believe God draws us to himself. And I believe that God's grace comes before our obedience because left to our own obedience, we would never come. Left to our own obedience, we'd be going the other way. But God turns us around. He opens our eyes like he did, or he opens the heart like he did with Lydia so that she would believe. Because once you see Jesus, once he stands on his throne, once your eyes are open, all you have to do, and the only real answer you say is, is wow, that's what I've been seeking. That's what I've been looking for. It's Jesus. It's God. It is all of his glory and majesty. You have to look for it. Look for evidence of his grace. Look for evidence of his power. Look for evidence of his holiness. Look for evidence of his mercy. If you look for it, you'll find it. And you'll never be the same. But you have to surrender. You need to surrender your life to Jesus today. You see, you need to give up your life. Which, metaphorically speaking, is a small, small sum in exchange for a treasure that is worth 
millions of times greater. You have to surrender your life up. You have to surrender your life by stepping out in faith, by giving him all that is dear to you and surrendering your life to him. But it's a surrender. It's a surrender because you are surrendering yourself to God, the God of creation, the one who loves you more than anyone else could possibly love you and the one who can offer you infinitely more than anyone else could possibly offer to you. It's... It's, no, it's, 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 it's not even a, a, a risk because, because it is so glorious, so good, so great. See, in the book of Amos, Amos said this exact thing when he said, Seek me and what? Live. Seek me and live. That's the question before you today. Will you be seeking God? Are you going to be like the person who is the um, treasure hunter? Are you going to be like the merchant who is seeking pearls? Or are you going to be the righteous who has grant, been granted righteousness from Jesus Christ so that he can be right with him no matter what he has done in his life? Or are you going to be the one who's just seeking yourself you're committed to yourself and you refuse to give up yourself. The choice is before us. Either self is on that throne or Jesus is. Which is it? Which is it? Heavenly Father, we are grateful today that you are on the throne. And Father, you know, as I read this passage, there are so many things that I, I need a new surrender every day of my life. I need a new surrender, Father, every moment of my life. And Father, I pray for those that are listening this morning, if they have never surrendered their life to Christ, if you have never really thought about giving up your life, and giving it to Christ. Placing Christ on that throne. Allowing Christ to be the ruler of your life. Receiving all that he has for you because it is better than anything you can have in this world. If you, if you want to identify with Jesus Christ this morning, what I want to ask you to do this morning is just step out from the pew that you're in this morning and come forward to let me know that you have surrendered your heart and life to the kingdom of heaven and to the king of heaven. If you're here this morning and you need to say, you know, I need to belong to a place to help me surrender. I know that one of the acts of surrendering is by belonging and serving the body of believers. If that's in your heart this morning or if that's been in your heart this day, I open the doors of our church to receive you as a member of this church. Every, every service, Father, we, we ask you to do a work in our heart and life. I, I just pray it would begin with me. I pray it would begin with me. Father, we say to each other uh, how good you are. Father, I pray that you would forgive me for denying the goodness that you offer me. For not seeking you, for seeking things just naturally. But Father, I pray that you would open my eyes again to see the beauty of the Lord, to gaze in your temple. Father, I pray that, that, that Jesus Christ would become more valuable to all of us than the richest richest contract, the richest deal that money could buy. I pray, Father, that you would change hearts. And I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand this morning and sing our hymn of invitation. Where he leads me.